Hello and very welcome at the international conference of the fourth International Ljubljana Street Art Festival. It's very nice to have you here in person. Also, great welcome to all of those who are listening and watching us on the YouTube streaming. We will be here at the conference for two days, but don't forget also on the evening and afternoon events that will be held uh, around Ljubljana. Uh, for this festival. So uh, this year the conference, uh, conference's theme is Periphery of Street Art. That means that it will draw on the world system theories, uh, both in terms of space power relations and form the perspective of liminal extra institutional street art practices and their synergies with other conceptual approaches and body politics. But uh, I'm sure that our steering committee will tell us a little bit more of what is going to be happening in the next couple of days and also in the next couple of hours. So please let us welcome the steering committee, Urška Plinz, Sandy Abram and Eric Ušić. Okay, thank you, Pia, for this uh, introduction. And yeah, on behalf of uh, the Institute of Urban Questions, I bid you a very well, warm welcome to uh, our street art uh, conference. And again, I'm honored to, um, to welcome you and also honored that we are hosting this event as part of the fourth street art uh, festival. Again, the conference brings together um, really a myriad of scholars and artists with a keen interest in street art and its practices also on the periphery, uh, as we'll be able to see in uh, five panels that are happening today and uh, tomorrow. So we are starting at approximately 10 every day. Um, and yeah, these panels and presentations have been arranged under different sub-teams and selected through a call for papers uh, and with joint forces with the Urban Creativity Platform, uh, the conference proceedings will be also invited for publishing in the international journal uh, Street Art and Urban Creativity later on. So I'll be short. Uh, I wish you a great conference filled with enriching discussions and deep insights. And I would like also take this opportunity to invite you later on to attend the exhibition of uh, the uh, Antigone uh, from Netherlands in the evening, starting at 7. And you are also cordially invited to other events of the festival that conclude on, uh, that are going on until Sunday. Uh, so there's going to be exhibition openings, uh, tours, uh, workshops, uh, and uh, other murals on Vlink and so on. So you can check more uh, a detailed program on our webpage and also on the flyers that are basically spread around. And finally, a massive thank, uh, thanks to all of the supporters, volunteers, sponsors, organizing teams, and for their help and support throughout this process in, in the last past, past months. Uh, and yeah, you helped to make this festival possible. So that would be all from my side. Uh, thank you once again for uh, arriving at the conference. Also, thanks for the guests from abroad uh, that we are finally be, uh, will be able to uh, have discussions live one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and yeah, I bid you a very well welcome again. I'll pass the word to Urška from Kino Shishka. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I would just like to welcome you all in Kino Shishka Center for Urban Culture. We are very excited to once again participate in this year's Street Art Festival and host uh, also the conference um, that we are about to start. Yeah, um, thank you all for coming and thank, thank you all collaborators. Eric. Yeah, I'll pass the word to Eric uh, for a few words on, about the conference. Okay, I will also be short like you too. Uh, so, okay. Welcome to everyone. As uh, Pia explained before, uh, we started from a broader concept of uh, periphery uh, that encompasses uh, many aspects of street, street art, relating it to the academic uh, scene, uh, addressing questions of uh, liminality, uh, extra and non-institutional practices, sub-political, art artivistic practices, queer, feminist approaches, and uh, so on. 
also through fi the five panels that we will um, listen to, to your presentations during these two days. Uh, we will hear something about the appropriation, reappropriation of public space, uh, the contestation of uh, dominant patterns in producing and reproducing uh, public space, but also about uh, new technological advances in street art and how street art fits in new t technological advances as well as the creation of uh, memory and counter memory uh, narratives in uh, public space that's al that is also an interesting uh, topic how street art creates uh, memory uh, scapes uh, but also uh, let's say in, in in short how marginalized groups uh, employ and use uh, street art as a tool of communication representation and uh, so on. Uh, so that's, uh, let's say, a short and concise uh, framework of the conference. Uh, before moving on, I would like just to say from my personal uh, perspective that I'm very glad to be here. The last time I was on the first edition of uh, the festival, and was a, it was a smaller festival, and I'm pleased to see that it developed so nicely and grew up so, so, so big. And I would like to actually uh, thank Sandy for his efforts in organizing uh, this and connecting all these beautiful people here. So I think he deserves at least an applause for his work during these years. <laughs> you, especially you. And okay, I think that's it. Uh, thank you, uh, the steering committee, uh, for uh, arranging this conference. Uh, so today we will have three panels, and I would like to ask you if any of you uh, has a question or uh, remembers a question during uh, each of the panels. Please just wait with them until the Q&A section. It will be held at the end of every panel. And those who are watching us on YouTube, please you can uh, write your questions or comments also in the comment box. Uh, so today we will start our first panel uh, with focus on political peripheries of street art. Uh, and the committee invited Mitya Velikonia to talk about his last book, uh, let me just introduce you, Mitya Velikonia, for those who do not know him yet. He's a lecturer and researcher at the Faculty of Social Sciences in Ljubljana, and uh, you may already know his previous book, uh, The Post-Socialist Political Graffiti in the Balkans and Central Europe. But today he came to talk about his latest book, The Chosen Few, Aesthetics and Ideology in Football Fan Graffiti and Street Art. In it, he unravels symbology used by soccer fanatics, examines the aesthetic of political extremism and how factions complement democracies. Let us welcome Mitya Velikonia. Thank you, Pia, for this introduction. Uh, I would also like to start with thanking the steering committee, Urshka, Eric, and of course, Sandy, uh, the machine of everything that is going on now for four years. So um, Eric stole that, my idea of the applause, you know, so we already did it, but I believe that he would, at the end, deserve another one. So yes, I'll speak about my latest, uh, my last work. I was invited to present it uh, here, and this is a specific, a very particular part of my ongoing research on political graffiti and street art that I'm conducting more or less systematically in the last 20 years using different methods. Uh, so some of the photos, you know, selection of selection of selection of selection, really of a few thousands of them, uh, will be presented here in a, in a loop, you know, so if you have some question about some particular one, you know, I can, we can interpret it together. So to make it clear from the beginning, I'm not a football fan. I don't like watching football. I don't follow football fo championships or national or club, uh, on, on national or club uh, level or even on international uh, level. My knowledge about football is, I would say, below average, but I cannot avoid the media coverage and everyday's, everyday news related to it. As I cannot avoid one of the most uh, characteristic feature, visual features of the European cities, towns, and even villages, something that really attract my full attention and interest. And these are football fan or ultras, graffiti, and street art. 
One of the most striking differences between European and other graffiti scapes is their abundance. They are everywhere. They are omnipresent. Even if you are just a flaneur in a Beneminian sense of the word, you immediately notice graffiti and street art of different football fan teams or groups. You realize immediately who runs the city, who's the boss here. And the second striking thing is that it's their variety, diversity, all those they come from the same football fan group. We find everything there, as we'll see in this short introductions. Introduction, symbols of football clubs, and on the other side, old, medieval, or even class, antique classic warriors, political symbols and local attractions, cartoon characters and symbols of violence. They are poorly made or excellent, excellently very crafty uh, made on the other side. So in the beginning of my, my, this particular study, I posed myself few questions. So how to understand this diversity of contemporary football fan graffiti and street art? What does they say to passers-by? What, what they communicate? In Foucauldian terminology, what kind of subjectivities they produce? And the second group, the second cluster of question is, is how this specific urban creativity uh, has this specific urban creativity has kind of common ideological structure, or it is plural or heterogeneous by definition. How I got materials, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm taking photos everywhere I go, more or less systematically. In the last two decades, I have about 25,000, 30,000 of different photos that I made myself and plus some others that I got from my colleagues and friends. But in, for, for in this particular case, I was limiting only to European scenes. So I was taking photos from the Baltics to the Balkans, especially from the Balkans, so from, from this region, from Moscow or St. Petersburg in the, east, in the east to British Isles. So I estimate that I have about a, a dozen of my collection of political graffiti, so about 2,000, 2,500 are related to, 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 to this particular topic. And in Slovenian case, I even did interviews with some of their authors, so the football fans who, uh, who do this, this graffiti. This is a specificity of this part of my, my, my research. So two, two words about the context. I always research them in a broader context, not only political and historical, but also related to the football and ultras world. However, I did not go deeper into other aspects of their culture. I was not interested interested in their non-visual expressivity, for example, chants, songs, cheerings, their slang, expressions, and so on, their corporal performances, choreographies, dress codes, tattoos, interior designs of their places, although I conducted some of the interviews in their headquarters, so to say, then how they are organized, what, are their, what is their social dynamics, and I was also not interested particularly in their uh, media, like uh, web pages, Facebook group journals, and so on. So I limited my research exclusively in their graffiti and street art, but as I mentioned before, in the broader, in the broader context. I was led by two ambitions in this research. First, I wanted to go beyond generalizations, that they are all the same, that they share the same ideology, identity, motives, and so on. And the second ambition was going beyond, on one side, condonations, and on the other side, condoning football fan expressivity. I don't, it's not my ambition to, to, to defend football, fa football fan subculture in front of very justified critics. But I don't want to generalize either, in the sense that football fans are just a bunch of violent, stupid, uneducated, authoritarian, politically right-wing youngsters. No, I want to go... I want to research this particular phenomena in all of, in all of its diversity, complexity, and uh, contradictions. So, uh, as Pia mentioned before, um, uh, the f f parts of this study was included also in two chapters of my previous book, and then in one extended version, also in the separate book that was published last year by Doppelhaus Press. In, in, uh, in LA, which is an interesting anecdote about this. I was contacted by uh, its, uh, its editor 
and she said that she's interested, she, 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 she attended one of my lectures and she was interested in this particular aspect of, of uh, political graffiti and street art. I said, but this is something so desperately European or Latin American. Do you think that this is interesting for, for the American public? Will they, you know, can be related to this because it's very, very um, local? And she said that she, she's, she, she wanted to take this risk and uh, the book started to live um, its life and I'm very glad for it. So how I did research this topic, what methods did I use? There are possibly four sides uh, of, of meaning when it comes to visual culture and graffiti and street art in particular, the side of uh, context of the author, of the piece itself, and of the audience. And I used this to the, 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 the second and the third one. So the side of image itself, and also the side of the author. So I was... Um, uh, researching the image so that the, this uh, graffiti or sticker or stencil or poster or mural or scratchiti or whatever. As such, using three methods, compositional interpretation, so this is an old school art history method, so how the things are put together. This is very quanti a qualitative method. Then the opposite, the content analysis, the frequency, how many times a certain motive repeats, you know, uh, and on the other, and on the third side, social semiology, which is my favorite uh, method as a cultural studies scholar. So this was for the side of the image itself. When I was facing only what is there, what is there on the wall, and in the Slovenian case, also the side of the author. So I was doing interviews, different on different types, with the authors of this of this uh, graffiti and street art. This was quite some time ago, in 2014, 2015. I relied my analysis on three uh, main theoretical sources. I will not go deeper into it, just few few names and few concepts. The first one is the concept of multi multitude of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, but in a slightly different way. As a concept of functioning visual plurality and heterogeneity that in the last instance form social groups, in this case, ultras groups. So multitude as internally different plural social ideology with concrete social consequences. Multitude is not only fragmented or dispersed, we are taking, but we are talking of an irreductible plurality made of singularities. Uh, uh, they act uh, together. So we must go, and this is kind of first theoretical standpoint, we must go beyond the simple notion of heterogeneity, but go deeper into it. This is just the starting point of the analysis. The second, the second theoretical source is the concept of raison by Deleuze and Gattari, a uh, rhizome which uh, ceaselessly establishes connections between semiotic chains, organizations of power and circumstances relative to the arts, sciences, and social struggles. So rhizome is by definition reductible neither to the one nor to the multiple. It has neither, neither beginning nor the end. It is always in the middle. So, and this is one of the key words, the key concept that I will use later. So in, in between, which grows and which from which it grows and which it overspills. So it's always kind of dynamic of it. So unlike a structure, the old model, which is defined by a set of points and positions, it is made only by lines. And the third concept that I'm using is metamodern, metamodernism, the concept that developed only in the last 10, 12 years uh, by different mostly art historians. I'm relying, relying here or on, on two uh, Dutch ones, uh, Vermeulen and Warden Aken. They're explaining how modernism that comes, metamodernism that comes after modernism and postmodernism. So, this is a question from, I believe, 1990s what comes after postmodernism? You know, and one of, the, one of the answers is kind of metamodernism. Modern, mo metamodern condition is made of oscillations and tensions between modern enthusiasm and postmodern irony, desire for sense, and on the other side, doubt coherence and chaos, the permanent and the temporary, the commitment and detachment at the same time, naivety and skepticism, unity and plurality. So we are speaking, when it comes to metamodernism, so the condition that uh, spreads not only in the field of culture but also in, in, other, in other fields, we have to understand it together. We can, speak, we can speak about these unsuccessful negotiations between two opposite poles. So the meaning is always in between. There's always some end between these two extremes. So if modern culture is um, 
uh, is, uh, can be defined with the, with the word for, so that kind of fanat fanaticism, we are going somewhere. Postmodernism, quite the contrary, neither nor, so kind of free, free floating. The metamodern culture can be defined with this end in the, in, in, in the middle, so fanatis fanaticism and frivolity. Yes, we can, as it was one of the Barack Obama's uh, um, uh, like, um, key, key concepts. And on the other side, nothing can, be really, nothing can be really done. So these were three main, main theoretical sources, including some other uh, concepts that, would like, that would, I would not like to go deeper into it, uh, semiology of Umberto Eco, Bart Hall, bricolage of Levi-Strauss, and others. So what do we find in this uh, uh, football fan, ultras, graffiti, and street art? There are four main groups, four main content areas. Their visual image, recognizable aesthetics, their values, and direct, direct display of political preferences. And I would like to go really uh, fast through all four of them. So when we speak about this visual self-image, so they have, how they present themselves, they can be presented as outlaws and defenders of tradition as known or unknown, rough and kind, hyper-masculine hyper and orderly, tough guys and loving fathers, expressing smallness and humbleness and on the other side superiority and pride. They present, they present themselves as sporty, as athletic, on the other side as drunkards, not so sporty. They are pro et contra. Second, when we speak about this second group, when I speak about the aesthetical part, uh, we find here complexity and directness. So on one side, you know, a lot of different fragments. On the other side, very clear message, sometimes including, you know, also the clenched fist that goes toward you, Shako Muglavo in Serbo-Croatian language. We find local and global inspirations, old and new symbols, uh, icons from their imagined past or from the contemporary popular, popular culture. Uh, Two typographies prevail. On one side, black letters, so this Gothic script, which is also uh, present in some other subcultures, rock, heavy metal, and even uh, hip hop. And on the other side, historically, this so-called fascia font on, or ultras library font that developed uh, through decades from the 20s and 30s uh, from, from Italy, from the futurist uh, times in, in Italy. The third group are the values that, are, that they are defending <coughs> or promoting. Love and hate, old and new heroes. They are dramatic on one side and on the other side very playful. That serious, we just saw one, and on the other side very ironic. They are pro and anti-Europe or global football, in meaning, you know, condemning uh, UEFA, FIFA, preferring old football instead of the corporate one. Uh, then they are internationalists and on the other side local patriots, marking, marking terrain at home and abroad. Loving club and hating its management. They love the city and hate rivals from the same city, and so on and so on. And just mentioning in all of free, on all, on all, in all these four groups, you know, just the most, most, most visible, most frequent uh, uh, oppositions, these polls. And now we come to the fourth group, the political messages. They can be very, very political, but on the other side, we find also very apolitical messages, very traditional. Uh, like thread, you know, we are just for football fan tradition, ours and of the whole subculture globally. Then mixing sport and politics, uh, right wing, uh, but also left wing oriented, chauvinist and, 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 and unchauvinist, and so on and so on. So there's a great, great variety uh, of motives, and it's impossible to make a unified hierarchical interpretative scheme which is also non-productive if we are looking something that we uh, want to, to, to see, that we, in a way, uh, make hypothesis from the beginning. So it's impossible to say on the other side that they are staying also on, only on the level of antagonistic oppositions. It's or, or, or. But we have to include this metamodern concept of and uh, in, in between. They do not come from one source. This is also very interesting when I was doing interviews with these ultras and hooligans even. 
how divided are these groups, and this is also shown, this is also reflected in their, in their visuals and also in their graffiti and street art. So I don't think that there are just variations on the theme in Handel's words. There's not a unity behind it would manifest itself in the set of diversities. This is some kind of old way of thinking, the present day cultural and political diversities. So the using the theories that I mentioned before, I will just make a very quick reflection of it. As I said, more it is in the text that I published. From the perspective of theory of rhizome, there's endless numbers of horizontal intersections in this uh, graffiti, graffiti culture. The notion of unity appears only when there's a power takeover of this multiplicity. Then it becomes very, very unified. Secondly, from the perspective of theory of metamodernism, so instead of this or in between or yet that would legitimate contradictions to, in graffiti and street art, we find end that connects and unites them. So with end, you can really connect everything, the most absurd, the most illo illogical elements together. So in a typical metamodernist way, we find moving for the sake of moving, seeking the truth that never expects to find. And thirdly, from the perspective of theory of multitude in these graffiti and street art, differences remain different. They do not form an organic unity. So to conclude, not to be too long, we are faced uh, in this, uh, uh, in the, in this uh, particular um, subculture a set of contradictions that actually work together. Uh, incoher inco incoherence, incons uh, inconsistency, impossible combinations, incompatibilities, irreductibility, non-integrity, and so on. Exceptions as a rule, but not to a rule. They work together, they make a statement, not despite differences, but because of differences. They can attract very different fractions uh, in, in, in one, in one uh, paradigm if, 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 if needed. So the thesis is not confronted and synthesized with the antithesis, uh, speaking philosophically, but is upgraded with another thesis and another one after it in a continuity of inconclusive inter interactions. So the thesis and the uh, other thesis and the other thesis and the other thesis and so on. They, don't, they, don't, they do not neutralize themselves or make a new synthesis. So we're not facing only the multiple roots of these visuals, but also very different branches, leaves, tweaks that come from these very diverse roots. So instead of linear analysis, uh, we, found, we find self-intersecting polygon when every point is of meeting meets another point of meeting and so on uh, and so on. So in short, there is not a, sing there is not a simple explanation or catch-all principle or anything goes. Instead, we find no fixed meanings, no exclusive view, no stable identity. Multitude does not explain, does not contemplate, but it stands, convinces, seduces, mobilizes. And this is not valid only for the football fan graffiti, but the political graffiti in general. So everything, ev everyone, everything, everywhere is simultaneously in the game. Until, until one prevails, until one power structure starts to identify something that they have in common, that they unites, that homogenizes, that reduces this confusing plurality of meanings into one, with a capital uh, letter. So this one, this common depends on and is defined by different interests, power structures, groups, political power, state even, uh, or other particular circumstances always anew. They're starting to use the strategy of, to use the Spivak's uh, term, strategic and essentialism. You know, uniting, you know, these different political paradigms with the football fan ones. And they are becoming, uh, as Donna Harrow would say, a power charged communication. So they can be used in political front confrontations as fighting force of some political parties and groups. We are seeing this not only here in the Balkans, but also uh, elsewhere in the past, but also in the present. In different nationalist projects, uh, the Yugoslav case is very, uh, very meaningful in this case, or even in wars, including the last one, the ongoing one in Ukraine. So in, that occasion, in, in, in these occasions, the microcosmos of the football fan graffiti and street art completely merges with the ideological imaginarium or visual, more narrowly said, the visual ideological imaginarium of the whole society to the microcosmos. So if you want to know what's going on in the society, especially in times of crisis on conflicts, we have to just check the graffiti, political graffiti and street art, and especially the football fan graffiti and street art. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, Mitya, thank you. Since you finished uh, earlier than we thought, maybe I would invite you back here uh, for some to answer some questions. Uh, maybe someone in the audience already has a question for Mitya. Yes, uh, Mitya, please join us again. Hey, ciao. Uh, so uh, I was interested in your uh, field work with the ultras that you said you did some interviews, and I, I don't remember if you mentioned it in your book or not, but so how many did you uh, talk to, and was there some resistance? I mean, I'm just wondering of doing similar maybe work in Zagreb or other parts of Croatia with these guys who are doing very controversial murals, potentially, you know, outright fascist or supporting war criminals. So what is your experience? I mean, was there some pushback uh, from the people you spoke to? I mean, were you nervous talking to them? Could you just explain a little bit about your methodology or yes. people you spoke to? Yes. Thank you, Viren. So I interviewed about 25 uh, of the guys who did this uh, graffiti or posted or, you know, di do different uh, in different ways connected with this, you know, visual expressivity. Actually, I did not have much problems, you know. First, of course, I did some previous, in my previous researches, I did a lot of, you know, field work, you know, from participant observation you know, to different type of interviews. So I had, you know, some, some experiences with this, you know. And the most important thing is to gain trust. Once you gain trust, you know, when I was doing, for example, nostalgia, studies, you know, we go nostalgia, which is also kind of complicated issue, you know, but once when, when you break, you know, this, this element of, of this trust, you know, you can really come into the, into the, into the core of it. Secondly, I was very much impressed with a book of a young Italian political um, anthropologist, um, Madalina Gretel Cameli, again, Sandy, that's Sandy's fault because he's recommended this book to, to me. Uh, she was doing an uh, interview and other, and other use, using other methods uh, researching Casa Pound movement in Italy, and also kind of alt-right movement, you know, so uh, right-wing squats, neo-fascist squatters, you know. Uh, the book is entitled I Fascisti del Terzo Millennio, The Fascist of the Third Millennium. And she explained in the beginning, you know, that you have to have empathy but not sympathy. sympathy. So she said, you know, I'm not sharing your views, you know, but I would like to know more about it, you know. And I noticed the same with the... And they were very happy to... to, 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 to uh, to collaborate, and I noticed the same, you know, with the football fans. You know, they want to, they want to not use, but you know, to take this opportunity that the world would know something about them, not through only through two groups that they hate more, not the opposite, the football fans of opposite teams, but the journalists. They don't know nothing about it. They're just a bunch of stupid blah, blah, blah. And cops, they just hit us and so on, you know. So once you say that you are a kind of a culture studies scholar, what, what are you doing? Journalists know <laughs> a snitch, you know, they don't see that. I don't, looks like a snitch probably. <laughs> so, so, you know, when it, it, it came relatively easy, you know, and it's very interesting. They don't, they, they don't consider the, foot, the other football fans, you know, as enemies, but as rivals. So for them, it's like a sport game. And it's very interesting, you know, that I got this line tracing way of getting to know other people, you know. Many times, you know, when I was talking to some of them, you know, I said I would like to know about the others, and they called them in the, you know, at there. I still have them in my cell phone, you know, so if you need addresses of some <laughs> ultras and hooligans from Ljubljana, just let, let me know. It's good to have them. <laughs> oh, no. And it is interesting, you know, how immediately, you know, you come into, you know, ah, who is this guy, some journalist, or what is that? And at the end, you know, they even appreciated, you know, that I don't know, a researcher, you know, is interested in something, you know, that their parents hate, you know, their relatives, or uh, that someone is really uh, generally interested in it, you know. But again, you know, gaining trust, you know, not judging, you know, just trying to explain, of course, also sometimes confronting, you know, the views, you know. And, you know, in Slovenia, such a small country, so they saw that I'm not some right wing, whatever, you know. So, but anyway, it was easier than, than, I, than, I, than I thought, you know. And this, as I said, you know, when I was talking to them, there was this talking about the political uh, the football fan graffiti and street art was just a small part of the whole performance, you know. 
uh, they took me to their headquarters, you know, to some bars, or in case of Maribor, even to their place that they have, you know. Then, you know, they showed their, you know, they were very proud, you know, to displaying their tattoos, you know, or they're putting me to sit, you know, in front of some, you know, like a uh, wall of fame, you know, of different, you know, stickers, and, and, and that kind of things, you know. Then slang, you know, and again, you know, this was just one small part of the whole, of the whole performance, you know. Uh, and using, using their slang, you know, and it was, you know, the, like every interview is not just doing interviews, people are not the machines, you expect something that you, you get something that you expected, but you get, again, you know, much, much more than, than you don't expect. But the main thing is, as I said, you know, and I learned, you know, from the classics of anthropology and, and ethnology, you know, from Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict, you know, to this young Camelli uh, anthropologist, you know, gaining trust, you know, so op playing openly, you know, and, uh, and in this, you know, today you are, you know, in, everyone can Google you immediately. You can not hide, you cannot say that you are, I don't know, whatever, you know. Uh, so it's, I was checked before, you know, so it's not that I just got contact, you know, uh, directly or, or indirectly, you know, but, um, and it started, you know, with few of them, you know, and then it started to, it started to roll. In short. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Any it, other? It, it was fun. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, any other questions, maybe? Uh, otherwise, I would also like to know, Mitya, since we see a lot of stickers and not so many graffiti here in your presentation, uh, what is actually the maybe the main purpose of this? Is it just about uh, showing where you were, showing where is your territory? Why do they use street art to communicate? Uh, first of all, yeah, I forgot to mention, you know, there are more stickers than in other, in other fields of st political street art, political uh, graffiti and street art, you know, so more stickers, more stencils, you know, you make them very quickly, you know, you just po pose them, you know, glue them and so on, so it's, it's much more efficient than making the real graffiti. Secondly, you know, uh, most of them are not graffiti, you know, are not, um, are not used to make graffiti, you know, so like, like in the political art, you know, you just write something, you know, only later, you know, they become more, more crafty, more sophisticated, you know, but yeah, it's everything that you said, you know, we are here, I'm here, you know, we are there, you know, so the, on marking the terrain on one side, you know, building their own identity, you know, which is also confronting the other identities, you know, and in some cases, you know, this is interesting case, you know, um, the super Jews, the group, uh, the football fan group from, from of, of Ajax uh, from Amsterdam, you know, presenting themselves something that are not. So a little bit of history of Ajax. It was established in the in the late in the late 19th century as the mostly club from the Jew, uh, working class Jewish background, you know. And we know what was happening during the war. And even now, you know, so it, it but it has this element of you know being the Jewish club, although they are not. You know, today it's a corporation, you know. But the football fans are still, you know, they call themselves super Jews, although they are, they are, they're not Jews, you know. So they're presenting something that they are not and using this in confrontations with the fans of Fire North who are sending them, you know, this is very hard to say, you know, but this is part of their, you know, controversies, you know, so sending to gas chambers, you know. So actually they are living in the world that does, that does not connect, you know, in the imaginarium that does not connect, you know, with the real, their real existence, you know. So they are building kind of super identity of something that really does not exist, you know, so a small, small element of, of this, you know. Uh, but also when it comes to more, you know, to, to really serious political or nationalist confrontations, you know, the war, in, the conflict in Yugoslavia in the late 80s and the beginning of 90s started with the clashes on the, on the football, fan, football terrains, and it reflected immediately also in the football fan graffiti and street art, you know. So it's kind of forefront, you know, of the conflict that are happening in the society. But everything that you said, you know, marking the terrain, building identity of us, uh, um, making, you know, uh, showing who are, who, not only who we are, but also who we are not and so on, you know. So, yes. Yeah. Maybe some other questions. Uh, we have one here, please. All right, um, so just a quick question. Um, I mean, in general, street art is always responding to these uh, social issues, uh, and it's so really flexible in terms of uh, how it responded to various changes in the society, and also you highlighted uh, the recent uh, also um, response from the hooligans and their, in their street art to the war uh, in Ukraine, 
also maybe were there any other responses to that? I don't know, the pandemics uh, or like, uh, did you notice uh, also the street art of hooligans responding to to those situation in the past year two? Thank you. Not to pan not to pandemic, but I was in Belgrade when those you know notorious uh, murals and graffiti and stencils and stickers about Radko Mladic were made. You know, so they were made. This is very interesting. You know, again, you know make the whole sub, sub chapter a case study you know so that Mladic uh, war criminal uh, uh, and uh, the, the first mural appeared in Vrachar so this is a wider center of, of Belgrade you know so this is a partisan football fan terrain you know so Grobari the grave diggers own it you know and it's interesting first they made this you know and um, Vieran will speak about something very similar tomorrow when it, in, in case of Croatia so it was not just you know uh, a mural that was made by 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 grave, grave diggers to him so not just about him you know uh, with inscription you know we thank your mother to, b to give birth to such a hero or something like that you know but it was also you know in the in the behind his image it was the coat of arms of partisan and then on the other side you know one of the heroes of the first world war you know the voivoda Mišić, I believe, was also put in play, you know, behind him was the partisan uh, coat of arms. And then on the other side, Raja Mihailović, a controversial, you know, um, Chetnik commander, you know, from the Second World War, again, you know. And there was also some others, you know, connecting, you know, these guys, you know, not only to the glorious, you know, Serbian history of the 20th century, you know, from these three wars, you know, the Balkan Wars and the First World War, the first one, the Second World War, and the last war in Bosnia and in Croatia, but also to our heritage to our partisan, you know, uh, so um, um, uh, grave diggers, you know, Grobari tradition, you know, so it's, it unites, you know, he's the Serbian hero, but he's also our hero, you know, so the daily uh, defense of the Serena Zezda cannot appropriate him, you know, uh, but I was just recently in Belgrade driving to it and, st uh, and stopped there for, for a few hours, you know, and there are so also some others, again, you know, on the on the main routes from and to, to the city center. You know? So not only these murals, not only these, you know, more crafty materials like stickers and stencils, you know, but also a big, you know, inscriptions, you know, uh, Radko Mladic, Serbian hero, or our hero, or whatever, you know. So again, you know, uh, in the more Serbian Zvezda part, it was, they were written in red, you know, in the partisan part, more in, in black, you know. So the city is divided, not to mention some other teams, you know, but these, these two are prevalent, you know. So no, I did not see any COVID-related, you know, football fan, whatever, graffiti. There are some others, you know, about conspiracies, political, Soros, <laughs> Islamistic, you know, so all, all kind of, you know, but not this. But you know, when it comes to because the, the, the Mladic issue came to came to came to front again last uh, last uh, autumn, and immediately, poof, overnight, you know, uh, and as Vieran will speak about tomorrow, you know, these are illegal uh, illegal installation illegal. Uh, um, uh, works, you know, that are then protected by the state, you know, by the unif guys in uniforms, you know, the guys who are dressed as civilians, and always I took photo, you know, also one, you know, a guy from the partisan, uh, partisan ultras, you know, sitting there, you know, a young kid, I don't know, he's 16 or 17, you know, guard, uh, like a guard there, you know. So again, you know, this, before, you know, the monuments were made by the state, offici they were officially made, and then also officially uh, uh, protected now, you know. Also, the illegal interventions, you know. So the graffiti and street art as vandalism, you know, is now approved also by the nationalist-oriented, you know, um, governments and people in power. You know? So an interesting switch, you know. But Vieran is doing this research, so he'll tell about about, about it more tomorrow. Okay, Mitya, thank you very much for now. You will have uh, more time to ask questions at the end of the panel. We will be switching to Zoom now because uh, Serjan Tunic is already there with us. Uh, let me introduce him for, uh, shortly before he connects. Uh, he's a freelance curator and researcher from Belgrade, Serbia, uh, currently doing his master's studies in art history at the University of California Dean Davis. Uh, with Liliana Radošević, he is the co-founder of Street Art Walks Belgrade and a member of Street Art Belgrade. He has published several texts on graffiti and street art, and uh, his seminar for today is titled Fuck Homophobia, Queering Street Art and the Adventures of Inspector Yoda the Wrinkled. 
and uh, he will be talking about the five-year career of very productive artists from Belgrade. Well, we could say artivist, since he is artist and an activist, uh, whose pieces are slowly disappearing because he was mostly doing them between 2013 and 2018. And I believe Serjan Tunic is now already with us. So let us... Welcome him. Welcome, Serjan. Very nice to have you. I hope the connection is fine. Can you hear us? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me well? Okay. Um, so, uh, Serjan, uh, we, will, uh, we will allow you to tell us uh, more about your paper now. And I hope you will stay with us also until the end of the panel for some questions from the public. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me here. Uh, basically, my presentation will be about the intersection of street art and queer theory in the example of uh, a, a local artist, Inspector Yoda the Rincoat. Let me just um, turn on uh, share screen. Can you tell me, can you see this well? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay. So um, my aim is to understand how queer act activism operated in the streets of Belgrade in 2010 um, on the, in the example of one artist called Inspector Yoda de Rincoat, uh, because I was very much interested to research how, um, uh, what is the importance of marginalized voices in public space, in, um, in this case, in the streets, in the case of street art? Um, so this is Inspector Yoda the Rinko, or Inspector Yoda's Gužvani in our language, uh, which will, who was operating between 2013 and 2018. It's basically a little stenciled pug uh, who uh, communicated a variety of messages which were ranging from anti-hate, social commentary, pro-trans, everyday sayings, uh, commenting on the migrant situation, for example, etc. And all of them were playfully appropriating common speech uh, and inserting a lot of humor. On the left side, we have one saying, Dije mi se revolucija. Uh, uh, translated uh, something like, I have a hard on re the revolution, then you are divine in the middle, uh, referring to the famous drag queen uh, divine. And on the right side, uh, there are two which were in the main street of Belgrade in Knez Mihailova saying, Neznanje rađa strah and strah rađa nasilje. Uh, ignorance gives birth to fear and fear gives birth to violence. Um, and despite its notable presence and I would say original style, uh, this artist's opus has not been properly analyzed as a whole. There is also no continuous production since 2018 and these stencils are basically ephemeral in its core, just like the rest of street art uh, and graffiti and are quickly disappearing. Um, and before continuing, I would just like to uh, clarify when I say the word queer, um, I'm using it as a strategic artistic practice of basically queering relations, creating subversions, resisting heteronormativity and defying oppression, which is um, uh, which exists in a symbolical and physical level uh, and which is addressed through art in a performative way uh, in public spaces, which are often very, very vulnerable to um, minority groups. And in this case, in Belgrade, in Serbia. Uh, to analyze some of these messages, I would refer to a structure made by Mitya Velikonya. I didn't know that he would be presenting before me uh, when I was making this research and this paper. Uh, but it was very useful for me to rely on this structure because uh, it's very clear and it opens a variety of discussions that sometimes can be overlooked when dealing with street art. Um, so I would pay attention to the artist, that is the producer, the, what's the intention, intentionality behind the artwork. Then we have the artwork, the content, uh, and also the context, the location, and public reception um, of a given artwork. So to start with the first one, who is Inspector Yoda the Rincoat? Um, 
The dominant image in the stencils is a pug called Yoda on the on the left side, and yes, it's a nod to Yoda from uh, the Star Wars. So it's an adopted pet dog of Nicola Nicola Herman that we can see in the middle with another dog, which is not Yoda. Um, Together, they basically embody Inspector Yoda the Raincoat. So it's a collaboration between the human and the animal. And the dog was not just an inspiration for the character, but also accompanied Niksha in almost all street art interventions and served as a mouthpiece for his messages. He told me that uh, when we made the interview together, he told me that the dog, in a way, uh, he was imagining what the dog... Uh, himself would say, seeing some of the messages, like hate messages in public space and uh, a variety of situations that you could see as a pedestrian in the streets. Um, according to help him to overcome addiction and by taking care of the animal, he was empowered to make positive changes in his own life and immediate surroundings. And let's say this collaboration was active from 2013 to 2018 when the dog unfortunately died. And Niksha is still trying to find ways how to continue uh, with his ideas, maybe by taking another pseudonym or continuing with the same character. It's an, an ongoing process. And as we can see on the right image, far right image, uh, it's basically a, um, a combination of a stencil of the pug with a speech balloon, uh, hand painted uh, with a hand ma painted message, and by creating this repetitive image, uh, Niksha basically created uh, a street art ego, uh, which is a true visual visual pseudonym and a character tag. At the same time, it's of recognizable authorship and anonymous, which is again a common feature in the world of graffiti and street art. Now to go to a few examples of the artworks. Uh, according to my research, there is almost 200 messages which he created during these years. About a third of them are general positive messages and everyday sayings. Other third is about gender and sexuality. And the last third are a, some sort of social critique. Um, and his messages are intentional employing queering according to my research, destabilizing heteronormative language and gender stereotypes, as we can see on the right example, which says, Budi muško oženstvenise, be a man, feminize yourself. Um, as you know, be a man is usually said as a teasing encouragement to be brave, to prove oneself. Here, this manliness should be proved by the very opposite, by being feminine. And this is underlined by the pinkish background uh, of the pug. Um, in a way, it could be a message that we need to accept. Macho qualities of being a man. On the left side, uh, and it's basically um, uh, presenting both the streets and the rainbow LGBTQ plus flag, uh, playing on the words which are semi visible in the background, which say Duga je ulica. Duga. Uh, is a word used both in Serbian both for rainbow and uh, meaning long. So the street is long, but the, the street is a rainbow. Uh, commenting, we can interpret this work as commenting on the, the public space needs to be accepting towards the LGBTQ plus community. But also I would say that this is an acceptance of uh, Inspector Yoda, the rink in the street art world in, in Serbia and in Belgrade. Uh, because his works were never buffed, were never crossed over by other artists. He he gained respect. And even in this world, there's a small pug, which actually refers to uh, one of the local graffiti crews. Um, another example, uh, when we talk about the location itself, is that while some of the messages might appear anywhere with no change to their meaning, uh, it is important to understand when the, when the location itself is key in communicating the content. Um, one of these uh, very site-specific um, examples is um, Izaji is Okuta, get out of the triangle on the left side uh, from 2015. Um, 
I don't know, are you seeing the new slide? Because the image I'm seeing seems to be having some delays. There's a, just see. Because I don't see that things are changing. Give me just a second to change the slides because I think that you're seeing everything uh, with a delay. I hope that now it's going to be better. Uh, so when we speak about the third aspect, uh, the location, okay, I see that the picture changed. Okay, this is good. Um, so as I said, while some of the messages might appear anywhere with no change to their meaning, it is important to understand when the, when the location itself is key in communicating the content. On the left, we have an example uh, called Izaji Stokuta, Get Out of the Triangle from 2015. The colors of the triangles refer to concentration camps, markings for undesirable groups, yellow for Jews, pink for gays, and black for lesbians. And the message is emphasized by placing the stencil in Stavio Saimiste, the old fairground, the location of the biggest Nazi camp in Serbia, which took away about 50,000 lives during the Second World War. Uh, on the right one, uh, one which is related to uh, Mitya's talk about football and sport fans and hooligans. Um, so there is a, uh, the message itself is very benevolent and saying Sada and Ailepše, now it's the best, now it's perfect time, something like that, which is a saying that Niksha told me our grandmothers uh, used to indicate, you know, when you know, when all the kids are fed, you know, there are no problems, you can relax, you know, every, everything is fine. Um, and he decided to use, to use this message in a space which is actually very homophobic, often very homophobic and uh, non-accepting, which is a sport, uh, sport fan uh, space in, in Belgrade, in territory of uh, Cervena Zvezda uh, fans, uh, Red Star Club. And he was actually caught by local kids who were protecting the, the murals. Uh, but he uh, he left unharmed because he said, no, I'm respecting you. You know, this is a nice message and I'm doing your colors. So they didn't know what to do with him. So they just left him be, which is an interesting way how to insert a content in something, in, in a place which is actually uh, very non-open for interventions. And to talk about the fourth aspect, which is the public, um, this example was originally reproduced in several locations, but this one received a special treatment. Uh, located on a wall in a small street overlooking a museum and a school nearby. So it, sta it stated Yebesh uh, Pedre, or like screw gaze. Um, and according to Niksha, his motivation well, it reflected the double meaning of the message implicating both the sexual intercourse as attraction or aggression and indifference. So this could be targeting either latent homosexuals uh, with aggressions towards the LGBTQ plus population uh, where uh, gays just want to be left alone. Um, and probably because the speech used the derogatory words word that can be read in a derogatory way. Uh, somebody reacting, crossing it over with red spray and uh, writing the words homophobia. So the so message was changed to like screw homophobia, which is very interesting because whoever made this reaction, again, followed the original intention targeting the homophobic sentiment, uh, well present in public space, uh, but also like in the, in the graffiti and for example, um, uh, hooligan uh, messages. Um, according to my research, uh, key aspects of public interventions by Inspector Yoda de Rinkold are a combination of anami about character, a benevolent character of a little pug, making clear critical and diverse messages made with stencils, uh, employing humor and wit in playing with words and meanings, and queering the public space, uh, in and creating a continuous production. So not just before a particular event or, a, for example, a pride parade, but a production which was uh, there operating for years. Um, and to conclude, um, 
the research points that I've encountered is that queer can be used as a strategy uh, and that there, there is something essentially, um, 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 uh, how should I say, um, connecting both street art and queer space and that is ephemerality. Uh, and I, we could also say that by queering the language and the space, a certain temporal queer space is created, which is interwoven in everyday fabric of the city, which is on the same plane like all the other messages and all the other uh, events happening in the streets. So it is not this specific, it is not a secluded, isolated space, but it exists with all other spaces and messages around it. Um, I think it's important to hear minoritarian voices in public space and that street art can be a tool uh, used for that. Um, and I think in this setting, uh, street art has great potentials to react against desensitization of the general public, confronting the hate messages and presenting a discourse of its own, which actually opened a new chapter uh, about street, queer street art globally, which seems to be an emergent field and something that I believe will be, be talked about more in the next years. Um, on the right side, we, we can see an image uh, saying, Izvini Nisimo stereotype, sorry, you're not my stereotype. Um, I hope that uh, this presentation was interesting and that the examples were uh, thought provoking. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them later on. Thank you. Hello, Sergeant. Before we lose you totally, could you just show us slide number seven because we weren't able to see it? Number seven. Okay, give me just a second. Because there was some delay in the connection. I'm not sure what was going on. Can you see it now? Uh, not quite yet, but uh, we see that you start. Ah, now we can see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you also maybe show us number eight, nine, and 10, because we didn't see those also. Oh, okay, there was some delay then in the connection. So this is the one um, uh, with the public reaction. Um, so this is, the, um, this is the one where I was trying to uh, de define the key aspects. Let's do a few seconds to read it. Mm -hmm. Now that you see the the next one, yes, I see it now. And the last one with the research points. Okay, at least the points we heard, maybe we don't need to see them again. Uh, Sergeant, thank you very much, and please uh, come back for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will continue with another guest uh, via Zoom. Uh, Sergeant, thank you very much. The next one will be Anton Polski. Uh, he will be with us directly uh, from Moscow. Uh, he's also an artist and an activist, independent researcher, co-founder of Partisaning Platform, author of publications and university courses on the history and theory of street art. Uh, he will talk about street art and the war in Ukraine, on how TV propaganda, the only source of information, for the masses in Russia and maybe also somewhere else, lies about war and how street artists, activists, journalists, protesters, etc., are trying to spread the information using graffiti and street art intervention. So we could say we have exclusive news uh, for you at the moment. Just hopefully we won't get censored by the connection. Uh, so we will need to just wait maybe a few moments to reach Anton Polski uh, 
and don't get confused by his last name. He really is coming from Moscow, not from Poland. Mm. So just a few moments and we will be reaching Moscow. Right, Mato? <laughs> Okay, so in the meantime, you maybe can think of some questions that will be following Anton Polsky, because unfortunately, uh, I need to tell you that uh, Chibo's presentation or the presentation from Pier Paolo Spinace uh, won't be able to happen because unfortunately he got sick. Uh, so right after Anton's presentation, we will continue with Q&A. Uh, so please stay with us. If you are uh, watching us on YouTube, you can write your questions uh, in the comments and we will read them to the lecturers uh, that are here with us or are hopefully going to be um, very, very soon. Mm. I just think maybe, Mato, you like to watch yourself in the camera so we won't see Anton so fast. <laughs> Or maybe really it is a uh, uh, censorship. Uh, we we can never tell. Uh, in the meanwhile, we have Mitya here. So if anyone has any more questions for him, you can also <laughs> state them now. Uh, but let's not forget, uh, after Q&A, we will have a short lunch break and meet again at 1.30 uh, p.m. We will continue at 1.30 with the second panel called The Periphery Street Art and the reappropriation of space. And then later we will have another panel that will start at uh, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. And we will hear papers about peripheral futuring of street art, technological advances in street art practice practices. Since we have three panels today and two tomorrow. So we, we will have a, s a little shorter conference tomorrow. It will be uh, up until 3 p.m. But today we are here until half past four. Uh, okay, I can tell you we already see the small picture of Anton. Hello, Anton. Maybe ah, this is still surgeon. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's me. I think Anton is not on the link. Yeah. Okay. Uh, otherwise, uh, Surjan, uh, maybe a short question for you since we have you here. Uh, I was wondering, are those bugs uh, coming up only in Belgrade or are, or is he doing them all over Serbia? So the majority of his production is in Belgrade because he lives in Belgrade or he lived in Belgrade at that point. Uh, and they're kind of grouped in a couple of locations around the city. But then he also created a few pieces, really a few pieces uh, um, in few places in Serbia. But there he made some when he was visiting Macedonia, which are in Macedonia, and some in Zagreb. But he was not going too much around um, the, the region. So I think maybe like 95% are in Belgrade. Mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, since uh, he's doing, uh, as we could see, like graffiti on graffiti of some ultras group uh, in Belgrade, and it seems this could. Uh, well, influence uh, his security walking through Belgrade. Uh, I was wondering, he's not working under pseudonym or is he? Since we could see his face, you did an interview with him. Is he hiding at all? Now he's not. Uh, I had the chance to speak with him and uh, he wanted his identity to be known and the story behind the formation of Inspector Yoda the Rinko to be known as well. At that time, he was working under the pseudonym. And as you can see, the, as, you, can, as you were able to see, uh, the pug doesn't have a signature. So it's a visual tag. But 
to to search him online and to find his profile, you needed to know his name in advance. So in a way, you know, it was hard to find him at the beginning. Uh, also, the message, also the character is very recognizable. Um, and um, I'm just thinking, have I answered your question? Please correct me if there is anything else I, I didn't care, answer. Okay. Uh, is he hiding? Is he not afraid? Aren't those graffiti no, uh, illegal? He doesn't need to pay any fines because his face is known to the public. He had uh, in in the in the image uh, that uh, it was on the um, uh, which was crossed uh, after the the football one. Um, he police uh, officers actually stopped him. I mean, they saw him there and they said, "You know what you're doing is illegal." And he was like, "Yes, I know." And you know, look at all the streets around us. There is a bunch of things, you know, like. So in a way, he couldn't just continued doing what he was doing, but he was also non-aggressive and very, as he likes to say, like he was uh, crazily positive. Uh, so they didn't find him, they just let him be. But I also think that um, younger police officers are around the same age as graffiti writers and street artists are, so they have some understanding what it is about. So what gets sanctioned is something which is usually very politically charged, or not, like in case of Radko Mladic mural that uh, Mitya mentioned. Uh, but right now, I mean, back then, Niksha was not hiding himself too much, but right now, um, he's very open about it. To, for his work to be known and his identity to be known. So it's not hard to find out his name and surname now. Okay. Uh, Serjan, thank you very much. Uh, Anton reached us in the meanwhile, uh, so we will give him the word. Anton, I hope uh, we can hear ourselves, so uh, we can almost see you, and uh, hope you are there. Please unmute yourself, and if you can, maybe even show us your face. Yes. Uh, hello. hello. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear, but uh, for some reason, I can show my face. Uh, I have some difficulty with the, with the internet. Uh, I'm I'm in Moscow, and internet here is really really bad. Uh, last time, uh, last month. Um, so let me try to share at least my desktop. Um, okay, go ahead. We are sure it's the censorship, so let's try to fight it. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Who knows what's, what's going on? So do you see my, my, my presentation? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. We can see you and hear you now. Okay, fine, fine. Great. Okay, uh, my name is Anton Polski. Uh, I'm an independent researcher and a uh, street artist myself. I'm writing my paper uh, on uh, Russian specifics and periodization of Russian street art. But uh, un un unfortunately, with the, um, with the war that was started in Ukraine by, by, by Russia, uh, have changed um, a lot. And uh, it's uh, basically impossible to continue my, my, my work, uh, at least uh, uh, in relation with any Russian institutions now. So, uh, and of course, me and my, my, my colleagues, we, uh, as artists, we did a lot of interventions in public spaces uh, in the last month. And uh, also with my colleagues, the researchers, we collect all the um, pictures and the publications on the political and anti-war war street art in Russia and in other places. So let me show you some pictures and also um, share of the, some of the thoughts of this ongoing research. So maybe you've seen a lot of pictures uh, of uh, street art, be beautiful murals uh, from all over the world supporting Ukraine. And uh, th those are the pictures uh, we've seen also, and some of them are interesting, but we mostly were interested in art, in street art in Russia and also in Ukraine. So uh, it's another picture from Poland. Uh, a lot of a lot of these uh, pictures were all quite positive and uh, basically forcing Ukraine to to kind of accept the peace Russia is providing, <laughs> which is uh, 
quite strange. And some of the pictures were also working with this meme of uh, a Russian warship uh, go to hell or fuck yourself. Um, it's one of them from, from Poland. So uh, let me explain what's going on in Russia in terms of art nowadays. So uh, uh, Russian government uh, kind of stopped pretending to be democratic in the last uh, month and uh, they started to basically ban all the public gatherings and protests in the public spaces and also they basically closed down most of the independent media here as well so uh, because of that uh, street art became one of the most important tools for for sharing your anti-war position in public spaces and it's also relatively safe as you can do uh, in, uh, uh, do you hear me? We can't really hear you at the moment, but we can see the picture now of Elena Osipova, the conscience of St. Petersburg on the protest, the older lady holding two posters. Yes. Um, okay, we can hear you back start again. The presentation. Maybe I can also open the PDF. Okay, let me try to open the PDF. All right. So, yes, the, maybe that's the, that's the best way to show it, but okay, it is something. So, basically, do you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Okay, good. So this is the Yelena Osipova. She's a sixty-something year old uh, protester from from Saint Petersburg, and even her can be arrested and beaten up by the cops. So that's why people decide to use different uh, mediums to protest. One of them is the quiet protest um, organized by the feminist initiative, uh, feminist anti-war. Um, uh, uh, Organization, so they been using their uh, bags and uh, do some small, organize some small talks in the public space to discuss war with the passersby in the metro, and also they been supporting some uh, guerrilla um, interventions in the public spaces, such as organizing small memorials for people who were, who were killed in Mariupol or uh, these um, price tags in the supermarkets. So one of the artists uh, in St. Petersburg, she's under arrest right now and she could stay in prison for about 10 years for uh, just switching these price tags where instead of the name of the product, it says, uh, for example, how many people died in, in Ukraine. And the government decided that they, they, she's she's been sharing some some information that um, people should know. So, and I should also mention that um, in the last five years in Russia, I think uh, feminist organizations were the most actively uh, self-organized. And during the war, also uh, these feminist organizations became the most visible and influential. And I see a lot of uh, feminist just anti-war statements in public spaces with the feminist approach like this one uh, actually i i met this uh, artist just on the street took some pictures of their work and also interviewed them for my research as well and also to do something that uh, can be uh, less uh, dangerous to in terms of being being arrested people organize this plein air in st Petersburg also to share the support for the uh, Ukrainian side. And that's our artist team, artist in Facebook, she opened this entire statement about spaces, one of the first ideas to work. And uh, actually a lot of, a lot of people uh, started to, to do this 
kind of an official campaign to work in, in many places in Russia. And actually, a lot of artists being arrested as well, since my friend who also was arrested with these statements in public, so poetic, uh, a lot of people also paid attention to propaganda and uh, the our religion. Mickey Tower in Moscow, and that's the one of the journalists who uh, was brought uh, for the Hitler state. And I was also a little critical of such statement. Uh, and also there are uh, different uh, rules people used to protest, for example, using um, an app for put the N word statement on the on money. And there's some small protests uh, in supermarkets so to switch uh, some, some less to pay. Were and because the dangerous process is uh, impossible to do some like bigger, bigger pieces or uh, statements, do like, really micro street art. Uh, just one in Moscow and one in St. Petersburg. Mm. It's uh, uh, at some point, it was even a must to say. And also, there are a bunch of uh, art um, kind of making fun of the situation, and that a lot of um, companies are closed. That was closed and also enshrined with another name. Also, to white people, the, the, the wrong image of Russia, people can be changing the tag. So it was a big discussion uh, with the Russian and Ukrainian artists about the of Russian culture. And uh, uh, some people think the culture is supposed to kind of fix some of this. Issue. And uh, some of uh, decided it's the way to do such things. And that's uh, that's the uh, some people, the officials, they painting, buffing the not war statement on the ice. And also, I should pay attention to some of the official uh, murals and even this one in Mario uh, supporting the the various from Russia image. And also to show you some from Ukraine as well. And another side this is the hawk. Um, it's often changed uh, navigation uh, in Ukraine for the uh, Russian soldiers. And uh, that's the picture from Odessa by the local artist who was mostly um, kind of cheering the Ukrainians in this war. And uh, I must say that. Uh, agenda of the artists really different uh, while in globally it's more about a peace and in russia it's no to war then in Ukraine it's obviously nothing different because it's uh, quite strange to uh, promote the peace in the country that is being at under attack so most of the art we can see in ukraine is either supporting ukraine army or sometimes it's, uh, it's the statements of the Russian force, and that's an interesting picture from Kiev. So basically, that's the local activist who's buffing the uh, map, uh, not to not be, not being used for the Russian saboteurs, uh, probably uh, working in Kiev. And that's another picture I did uh, uh, when I was. It, it's quite complicated uh, the the so. I did another project uh, counting Brussels and 
uh, working with somebody to do the other side of this conflict, and it was the connection with the Soviet West and becoming Moscow already. So now I want to say some, some of the words maybe I should in this presentation. Sorry for the audience, I don't think with my computer. Sorry. Uh, Oh, can you see me? No. You can. No. Yeah. Uh, but can you hear me? Thank you, Anton. We can barely hear you, but uh, at least we were able to see the pictures well. Can you hear us? Okay. Uh, we will try to do... Yes, I can hear yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for the difficulties. Okay, we will try to do Q and A mm. for all three of you now. Anyway, uh, starting with questions for Mitya, we got some questions on the uh, YouTube. So uh, people are wondering. Uh, what is the relationship between ultras and the people who do political graffiti in the same city? Uh, you can also come here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it's, yeah, it's easier. Yes. Uh, so, um, you know, if, if we are thinking very schematically, you know, so on one side there are more aesthetic type of graffiti, you know, those who are not directly political, although I believe just, you know, spraying illegally on the wall is already a political message in itself, you know, so really the message is the, uh, the content is the message, you know, um, in, if we try to refer to, to McLuhan, you know. And the political graffiti are usually not made by those who are making aesthetic graffiti. Now I'm generalizing, you know, but I, I believe that there's there's a point in all this, you know. So uh, there is a connection in in conflict times, you know, with those who are doing, you know, the, the football fan graffiti and political ones, you know, because there's a lot of combinations of of, of politics and nationality, chauvinism and so on, racism, homophobia, blah, blah, and uh, uh, and those who are who are who are members of this football fan graffiti, they come together. In few occasions, there's also this left side, that most, mostly it's this right side that is prevailing in these groups, although they are mostly saying that they are politically neutral, but judging from their visual expressivity, it's very clear that they are leaning more to the right. But still, again, you know, I'm, I'm very generalizing, you know. So in, in some occasions, you know, some of this, you know, football fan political graffiti are, uh, graffiti are very political in their essence, you know, so that you cannot deny that there's a connection between them, you know, but in some cases, you know, they're much more, how to say, general on one side, you know, on the other side also very much connected with this traditional element of the football fan graffiti um, uh, and, and street art, you know. So yes, there is connection, but it depends, and this is also the point of my presentation, it depends on the political situation uh, in, 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 in a certain society, you know. So in more, how to say, quiet times, you know, they are mostly uh, oriented toward themselves and the other football fans, you know, but when it comes to times of crisis and so on, they are much more connected with what is going on in, in, a, in a society. And sometimes, you know, they are, you know, in. Um, there are political graffiti art, political graffiti artists, writers, you know, who are not football fans, you know, and on the other side, there's another extreme. They're just doing football fan graffiti and street art, you know, but in some cases, they are, they are together. Uh, and there are many studies, you know, um, unfortunately not very known in, 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 in public, but still they are, you know, showing this close connection between the football fan, between the football fan um, groups, you know, and the uh, Recruit, recruitment of the uh, uh, right-wing extre extremists, you know. Uh, there are also some, you know, half studies, if I say so, you know, unfortunately not the real ones, you know, uh, showing this connection, you know, here in, in Slovenia, especially with this uh, most m more organized uh, football fan groups uh, as they are in Maribor, Ljubljana, and even in Nova Gorica, and, and partly also in, in Celia. Mm -hmm. And there was another question uh, via YouTube. Uh, do they communicate, collaborate, or fit for a dominance of walls? You mean between them? Between, between them, them, yeah. 
they of course they compete. You know, again, you know, if we are broadening a little bit, you know, this discussion. You know, political graffiti are always, you know, they're always crossed over. They're always confronted. You know, when it comes to aesthetic, you know, you show more respect, or sometimes when you don't agree, you know, you just write a comment, you know, but still in a respectful way. When it comes to political graffiti, it's always, you know, very strong antagonism. Uh, you know. We have a young scholar, Monica Crope. I hope that she will present uh, in this uh, um, in, the, in this festival as well. Her works, you know, she's doing exactly you know this right wing, left wing graffiti struggles. You know, not only in Slovenia but in Ser Serbia and Croatia uh, as well. So there's always, always confrontation, and in this micro world of uh, football fan graffiti and street art, you know, there's always you know. A response to it, you know, and also this element of, I don't know, adventure, you know, of daring, you know, for example, coming to from Ljubljana to Maribor and doing their graffiti, you know, of the Ljubljana team, you know, it's also showing, you know, of, of this, uh, of, 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 of courage and, and, and everything, you know, so collaborating not but confronting all the times, you know, but again, you know, when it comes to this personal level, you know, they are, for example, when I was doing interviews, you know, they are saying, you know, that they know the guys on the other side, but they respect them as the rivals, not as an, as a, as a, as enemies or opponents, you know, sometimes they, I don't know, congratulate when the, they're having, when the child, when they're, you know, this, they're having children on the other side or helping them each other, you know, when it comes to campaign against the repression of the state toward the, uh, uh, football fans, you know, they again, you know, they, they, they come together, not only in Slovenia, but I saw uh, examples also in other countries, you know, so um, united fans against repression of the state, then against modern football, you know, uh, I believe I showed a, a piece there of the Romanian, united Romanian uh, football fan groups, you know, attacking, you know, this corporate type of, 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 of football. Then uh, this nationalist chauvinist element, you know, I believe that I also showed in this presentation, you know, how the Russian no, football teams, you know, are against the Caucasian football, you know, the intrusion of the Caucasians, you know, so these bad guys, you know, not only in the football fan, which is a broader story, not only on the football fan uh, terrain, but also globally, you know, bringing, you know, crime, crime and, and so on, you know, so there's a lot of this combinations and on the other side, you know, combinations of all kinds, you know, from negative to, to positive, you know, and we are used to because the media coverage is most of, pretty much, you know, one-sided, you know, we all only see one, one side of it, but that's much, much more, and I was trying to, you know, to dive in this complexity and see also the layers that are not, that are not shown, that are not so obvious, you know, that's why I also decided to talk to, with these guys, you know. So. Any other questions for Mitya? Uh, Vicky, do we maybe have some uh, other questions on YouTube? Okay, uh, then Mitya, thank you very much. Uh, others uh, can also read uh, your book uh, if they want to learn more. It's called The Chosen Few, Aesthetics and Ideology in Football, Fan Graffiti and Street Art. And now let's switch to uh, Serjan. Uh, any questions for Serjan, maybe? Yeah? Just say it bravely. We have one question here, please. Uh, yes, I think. Uh, hi, Surgeon. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Really wish the people that are on Zoom were actually here so we could talk more during the break. I have a, an under-formulated question about, um, I guess, queer as a strategy, kind of methodologically, in terms of your focus. Yeah? So you've, you've adopted... Um, Mitch's model was structural model, which is a really neat way to kind of break it down and approach the artist and the artwork and the public and the location. But that, that's kind of an old school model. No offence, I was, I was taught in this stuff as well. That isn't terribly queer. It assumes a singular author, for example. Uh, it assumes sometimes a singular public. You were starting to talk about some of the collaborative work on the street where you've got people crossing through and adding to this kind of conversation in a way that disrupts notions of singular, particularly male, cis, white authorship. Have you thought of uh, queering your methodological approach in line with your focus? Sorry. Hi, I'm Susan, by the way. Can you repeat once more? Because connections are a little bit bad, so I, so I hear you like from a distance. I'll try to say that in five words. Um, have you thought about using a repeat photography or some methodological approach that would allow you to capture 
a non-singular authorship. So that all of those responses on the street that kind of collaboratively produce queer. So in this case, uh, this is more of a historiographical research. Uh, so all the production was from 2013, 2015. Um, if he was still working, I would definitely be present to record, um, you know, how people are reacting and maybe seeing, you know, how responses in public space are developing over the course of maybe like a few days, because according to his uh, interview and experience, few pieces were always erased. Like there was one which said, uh, is the for Eclipsovis, like, um, let me just remember, explore your clitoris. Uh, and he said that that one was crossed over in a matter of days or weeks. So that would be interesting to see how they were actually living in the streets. But at this point, uh, a lot of examples I showed don't exist anymore. Many of them do, uh, but a lot of them simply disappeared. So it's very hard to figure out, uh, like in the last example where I was talking about the public reaction, it was very uh, hard to figure out when, when these interventions on his work happen, uh, who made them when they were made? And if some pieces were disappearing, why? Were people simply renovating the building or they had something against his work? So it was very hard to, uh, to go into in details in regards to some of these concerns. But if he continues working again, we were talking about maybe doing some actions which would be more like participative and involving more people. So who knows? I hope I answered. Uh, yes, you did. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Surgeon, maybe? We have another one. <clears throat> Hi, Surgeon. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I noticed that uh, Inspector Yoda, the wrinkled, uh, wrote in uh, Latinica. So was this a particular choice? I mean, or... I mean, obviously, it, it was. Can you comment on that? And maybe just in general, uh, graffiti in Belgrade. I mean, I, I imagine it's probably getting more and more in Chirilica than uh, Latinica as the entire society is just, like, it's becoming more official. But was this decision to use Latinica, like, also some kind of protest or a statement, or is it just a preference? This is an interesting question. We haven't spoke about it. I need to ask him. Um... And as you know, so we use both alphabets. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, uh, Chirilica, the Cyrillic one is often used by the, by the government, you know, by the official uh, institutions, uh, but also by nationalists. Uh, so, some, so sometimes by using Latinica, you're kind of resisting that nationalist narrative, but sometimes you're just using the, the, the other alphabet. Uh, I would say that he was using. I would assume he was using something that he uh, that he was utilizing in his everyday life. Maybe because uh, Latinica could also speak to other uh, people from the from the Yugoslav countries. Uh, because, for example, when he was in Macedonia, he was writing in in the Cyrillic alphabet in Macedonian. So he wanted the pieces to communicate to. To, uh, to the local people, but also have that kind of wide uh, pot potential of readings. He did a few pieces in English as well. They were not so frequent, and there were some pieces which were simply abstract. Um, but yeah, I think that it's uh, simply like a, like a personal decision. Um, I don't remember him having any any inscriptions in, in the Cyrillic alphabet. And just to say, like, the the reason, uh, the way how the whole project is imagined or initiative or collaboration is that he wanted to have direct contact and direct communication with passersby. So, and I would think it's one of the, um, one of the, I wouldn't say positive sides, but one of the more constructive sides of street art which has that aim to, to communicate rather than being uh, closed and, you know, with messages which are 
part only of, of a certain group. No, the idea was to communicate as to a wider audience as possible. Any other questions for Surgeon, maybe? Can I ask you, Surgeon, uh, since these are some older graffiti, uh, well, not that old, but still older, would you say that uh, queer or LGBT street art is still one of the most provocative in Serbia today? I'm not sure because this is one of rare examples of LGBTQ plus or simply queer, uh, queer, well, examples, artivist examples in this case. There are some, uh, when you go into history and, and researches, uh, you see that there were other examples. I remember some from the streets of Belgrade from like mid 2000s, but this is not frequent. There are, you know, like, if you're in the United States, where I am right now, you can find a number of artists. Not hundreds, but still you can find a certain number. In Serbia, I don't know about any other initiative after his work who were kind of querying the space in this way. Uh, and there might be several reasons for that. Uh, but this is what I want to underline is that this, this is one of rare initiatives we have. And one of the reasons I wanted to uh, pay attention to his work was in a way, uh, I won't say to document the work, but recognize the context, contexts and work with him and with the artworks while they're still present in the streets and available. Thank you, Surgeon. If there aren't any more questions for Surgeon, maybe we can try to ask something Anton as well, maybe some questions for Anton. Thank you. Well, Afton, Anton, if we can Hi. hear each other uh, and uh, okay. if you can answer, uh, I hope we will hear you now. Um, I was wondering whether, uh, since you have, uh, you just told us that one of the artists is in jail now and can stay there for another 10 years, is it maybe well, not illegal, but dangerous for you as well to even talk about these themes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's probably dangerous. Uh, it, they are not catching everyone because it's just impossible physically. But uh, if you're visible, it's uh, dangerous. And some people try to escape the country now. Actually, a lot of my friends, they had to leave the country. And uh, uh, so, yeah, it's still doing graffiti and street art is maybe less dangerous and it's still possible compared to some some other forms of protest and also it's accessible for people who never protested before so they can do it just in the night printing stickers on their printers or anything else so it's uh, it's still probably the best uh, best tools to to share the alternative opinion since actually we just heard about half of your presentation, uh, I'm also wondering whether uh, you mentioned some other types of street art, such as graffiti on ice uh, and similar, and that there is the difference between uh, like this very peace propaganda in Russia and this war propaganda in Ukraine. But are there any... Uh, not very peaceful street art uh, pieces also in Russia. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, when I said about the, the peace or no to war, so basically most of the artists uh, who at least uh, have this similar opinions, they protest against the war and they try to share the information and their opinion with others also to be visible and to show that not everyone is supporting the war here and some of the statements they are more poetic some of them more direct and also there's a big discussion about um, uh, um, from the feminist position that uh, basically the violence in, in homes or violence towards the women somehow connected to the to the violence uh, in the war 
to show that the whole society is poisoned with, with the violence and the power here. So there are different ways to protest and, sh and show the opinion and some of the work they're not so direct and sometimes they provoke the discussion. And, uh, and yes, in comparison with uh, this more like specific and uh, peace, peace, peacemaking uh, statements here, of course, in, in Ukraine, is the, it's a different situation. And obviously, street artists are mostly trying to support the uh, resistance uh, of, the, of the Ukrainian army. And also, it's interesting, some of the examples I showed that how the government is trying to use street art to uh, mimic the um, civil activism, uh, trying to kind of uh, show uh, this that people support this uh, pro-war, pro-governmental position. And there are not so many examples when people really put Zs on their, their cars. And I also noticed that uh, some of the car drivers, they put the Z sign on their cars in, in, in the city, but then most of them, they removed it. But I see a lot of uh, anti-war statements on the streets. So it seems like um, at least those people who are active, they're sharing this anti-war uh, position. But they have no kind of uh, access to the, to the money or institutional support. So uh, the government is easily kind of silenced them in terms of uh, media and, and et cetera, through forcing us to use VPNs. And as you can see, I'm barely, my, my computer and internet is barely working. So I don't know, maybe I was even attacked by the hackers now because it was really w working well uh, just right before five minutes before my presentation. So I don't know what's happening. I need to figure out what's going with my computer now. Maybe I was attacked. I don't know. Well, let's hope for the best, uh, Anton. Uh, you're talking a lot about anti-war street art, but are there also some anti-Putin uh, like slogans um, that maybe were on the streets even before the war. Yeah, of course, there are a lot of uh, statements like this, and it was even more visible like be before. Uh, but now, um, yeah, there are some some works obviously uh, connecting the Putin's uh, role in this war, and uh, uh, there are maybe not that many of them. They don't personify the, the war with, with Putin. I don't know for what reason. Uh, maybe it's also because uh, on the one hand, um, majority of people are somehow support Putin. Uh, but on the other hand, like maybe a lot of them, even those who support Putin, they, they don't support the war. So maybe it's uh, strategically uh, like protesters, they're trying to kind of establish the connection with the, with the passersby, with the people. In, in terms of not to kind of protest directly against the, the government, but maybe against the war, that's the main task for them. I don't know for that, for what are the reasons not to person, but compared to the, to, to the West, obviously most of the murals I can see, they're like, at least a lot of them, they're kind of like show the Putin as a main rep representative of the, of the Russia and the, the war and aggression. And also, yes, I want to kind of mention, I also mentioned the feminist uh, import, importance of the, in, in the current situation. And also, uh, in terms of art, the institutional critique is, uh, is highly visible because uh, also in, in, in relation with the cancellation of the Russian culture, what, what it's called, because uh, people start to criticize different art institutions on the one hand to be silent in the current situation. On the other hand, um, kind of switch the attention from, of the people from the political agenda to, to consumerism. And also for being really um, neo-colonies, -col -col kind of used as a source of or power of neo-colonization through art. Uh, um, so there are different uh, discussions about it. And also uh, discussions about Russia is a in, in like a, probably the last European empire. And also decolonial approach is really like a useful to analyze the current situation. Unfortunately, I don't 
kind of have time to explain the theory and how the colonial uh, theory is being used now for the for the artists and for the um, researchers but it's a really important uh, piece of the discussion maybe some questions for anton if not maybe just uh, last short one we saw aha uh -huh, we have one aha uh -huh, yes we do hi anton um I'm glad we got to hear more of your words once we turned the images off and we saw all the images before. Um, I just had one uh, question. I guess um, it looked from the images as if there's kind of a, a trend towards increasingly micro or smaller scale street art with stickers and little things in, in, in supermarkets. Is that, I guess, in response to the risk or the greater level of risk uh, right now, particularly with anti-war graffiti? Is this, is this kind of being matched by a higher rate of, of buffing? Is like the zero tolerance stepping up as well? Like what, what, what is it? Are there any murals left? Are people doing larger work still or is it all getting very small? Sorry, I mostly heard the echo of your question. I heard something <laughs> about micro art, but uh, it's really hard to really understand what... what maybe okay. can you repeat? Or maybe I'll the, use the, two words what, again. Moderator? Can you is, summarize the question? Yes. Is work on the streets getting smaller in response to risk? So the risk? So yeah, it's risk. So people use the, the micro street art to, kind of to, be, to do it quickly. And people also share different uh, uh, ideas how to do it the, in the quickest uh, way. So graffiti is being kind of useful in this terms because the graffiti artists, they know how to do it uh, with the less, taking less risk. And where did you get the pictures of this street art from? I imagine you weren't traveling to Ukraine at the moment. No, no, it's, it's in, the, in Ukraine, it's impossible. But mostly, so uh, I run the, the Telegram channel with the, with, where we co uh, collect all the pictures and artists just sometimes send it to me and also through journalists and through different publics and channel, channels on Telegram, uh, we collect all the pictures. And also we have some street hunters in different uh, cities who take pictures uh, uh, and send it to us. And we also do, do some, some art on our own as well. Okay. Don't say too much. As you said, maybe someone is listening. Uh, any other questions for Anton, maybe? Uh, otherwise, Anton, I would like to thank you very much, as well as Serjan and Mitya. Uh, we will take a short break now and uh, see you next time, maybe in person. Thank you very much for, uh, for well, what we could, would, was able to hear and see. Thank you. I'm sorry for, for all the troubles with the with the electronics. No problems. Just Thank you very much. Let's just hope you won't have any troubles. Uh, we will continue and in hour and a half at 1.30 p.m. We meet again here for the second panel. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>